Hi, and welcome to SPL. Today we're going to talk about the new Channel One Mark III, our latest channel strip. Now, before we start digging into all of the details uh, of the Channel One, I'd like to give you a bit of a view to the late 90s, where we initially designed the very first Channel One. Back in the days, we developed a lot of interesting new technologies for de-assing, compression, mic pre's, and we all comprised that into the Channel One. For example, we had the gold mic preamp, a tube preamplifier that went in, into the Channel One. There was the de-asser that we designed in 95, which is has some special features. I'm going to talk about that later. Um, the Dynamax compressor that was very well received in the, especially in the live community. Uh, that went into the Channel One. So all of these products were in uh, as, as a mono channel strip uh, in that piece and it became a huge success for us. About 10 years after that, we gave it a facelift and it got a silver front panel, uh, but the, the functionality stayed the same. And it stayed the same until now, 2023. Um, about three years ago, we were thinking about, ah, yes, we want to come up with a new channel. So we, uh, and then we decided now we want to keep the channel one and uh, just take this to the next level, um, make it a very modern channel strip. Uh, so when we started looking into it, there was one thing that we definitely wanted to have in there, and that's the transient designer. That was never been put into a channel strip, and we think that's a huge game changer for such a piece of equipment. Uh, and our engineer, Jens Grunwald, he put so much work at heart and time and hours and, and, and all he knew into it to make this a perfect channel strip. We're super happy with the result. Now, let me run you through the specifics of it so that you know exactly what we're talking about here. So every channel strip obviously starts with the microphone preamplifier. This is this section over here. As you can read, it's a discrete preamplifier. And discrete means that we're not using um, IC, we're using individual transistors. Uh, that is usually done in boutique preamps because you get the possibility to fine tune uh, noise uh, as well as THD, as well as the sonic behavior in terms of peak response and, and liveliness and all of the features that you would like uh, to tune uh, the sound of a mic preamp with is done in with uh, uh, the selection and the layout, the design um, in a discrete preamplifier. If you use an IC, which many companies do, you're bound to what the IC is doing and that's it. There is no freedom to, to change anything and to, well, tune the sound. Um, so that's here. It's a boutique design. It's a discrete preamplifier. And one of the unique features in here is that you can see it up here. We have like a, a selection of two mic inputs with individual phantom power switches and the line instrument input. Now, with the two mic inputs, MIG A and MIG B, you can effectively compare microphones that run through an identical, the same mic preamp. Now you can imagine that this is, even if you have two mic preamps that are from the same company, they don't sound the same. Uh, and in here, by doing it this way that we switch the input, yes, you have, you can directly compare just the sound of the microphone. We believe that's a huge plus and a huge asset and it helps you to exploit your equipment, your microphones to the fullest. Now, what needs to be done when you make a selection like this is that you protect the microphone. That means in the event of switching from microphone B to A or vice versa, you can hear a relay click in the background, and that means we're switching off the phantom power, then we're switching over to the other microphone, and if the other one needs micro uh, phantom power, it is then put onto um, the feeds after it's been switched. So that protects the microphone, and, and it's also you don't have any audible clicks while um, 
you select the microphone. There's just a, mim a moment of silence in between them. Now, you may also have your favorite preamp, and everybody has a favorite preamp, and that's cool. So you might have your microphone with an external preamp. You want to compare that with the Channel 1's preamp and maybe some other microphones. So that's when the line input comes into handy. So you can switch between MIG A, MIG B, or line input, and you can effectively compare that preamp with a third-party preamp and the, and the microphone connected to that. Furthermore, if you have your instrument inserted into the jack here, this is a switching contact, so it will be preferred over the line input. The other functions are typical to a mic preamp on the pad. Obviously, when you mic very loud signals, you will use a pad, so not to overdrive the, the, uh, the mic input. And there is a phase switch or a polarity switch, I should say, and the polarity is being uh, used, well, if you, especially in, in the cases where you mic the same instrument with multiple uh, microphones, let's say a drum kit, for example, or a snare or whatever. So what you're going to do when you have all your microphones connected and you, let's say, you look into in your door and you look at the waveforms and you just play a snare drum, you will see that the peak of the snare drum comes up and you might see another microphone picking it up, but it just goes the other way. So that, then you know, okay, that microphone preamp needs to be switched in polarity so that it also exhibits a peak. Otherwise, it would result in cancellation. And when you mix all the tracks together, the drums wouldn't sound any good because some will cancel the other instrument. So that's where the polarity switch is important. Another thing where it comes uh, into play is when you give somebody a headphone mix. And when you listen to your own vocal over headphones, um, it might be better to uh, inverse the polarity of the, of the voice itself so that it not coincides with your own inner bones, for example, because you receive your own voice in your head at the same time. And if it's in phase, that might be disturbing and not very clear, but when the, this is out of phase, you sort of hear them one after the other. And that's even not one of the other. You hear yourself clear, I should say. So that's another uh, uh, good example to use the polarity switch. And the third one is the um, high pass. Well, obviously, uh, this is to prevent all of the low frequent noises, touching microphone stands and stuff like that, to not enter the recording. And this is a filter that rolls off from 70 hertz downwards um, so that it gets the very low frequent um, frequencies out of the way and you have a much clearer recording. Also, you take the levels out of the, um, out of the game that are coming up with these very low frequencies and they are usually uh, um, yeah, driving the AD converters into, uh, into overnote easily. The next feature is uh, the tube saturation. It obviously has a tube inside and what you do here, you saturate the tube to give a more, um, yeah, sort of like uh, a, a denser tone, a, a tone that has more power to cut through the mix. And it, it also adds a little bit of roughness if you or give it a more of that saturation. It's a nice feature. If you use it subtle, it is just there to, to take the vocal in front of the mix. Very cool feature. And it is off if it's here in the off position. There is a relay in the background and you might hear it clicking. So if it's in the off position, that stage is entirely taking out of the signal path. Now you might want to have this with the, uh, the, the preamp signal, or you want to say, well, I would rather like to have it at the end of the, of the, um, of the channel one. And that is also possible with that switch here in the center, the tube post switch. If that is engaged, then the tube saturation will be right after the equalizer. There is another little feature to that tube post switch. When you switch the mains on, it will flash for the period in which the tubes are warming up. 
So once that is done, it lights permanently. Okay, so the next function in line is the de And the de well, uh, as you might know, SPL usually does things slightly differently than other companies, and the de is a very good example for that. Uh, usually, you uh, de involves compressing a certain frequency band. Uh, and by doing that, the, the nasty S frequencies are being sort of lowered in level. But you are affecting a wide range of frequencies around that S, which usually tends to have negative side effects on, on the vocals, either starting to be like lifting or something, get this kind of effect, or it's getting nosy in the sound. And uh, yeah, that's not nice. So um, back in the days, we were thinking about how can we improve this? And uh, Wolf, my, my, my founding partner and friend, he came up with the idea and said, well, what about if we cancel the S's and, and not compress them? And, uh, and he came up with a circuitry that exactly does that near to perfection. And it is a filter that hones in on the S frequencies, which is about six to seven K when you select the low frequency, the low switch up here, or it's about 11 to 11 and a half K, just an octave above about roughly when you engage the, the high switch. Now you might want to do one or the other or the together. That's, that's, that's up to what, it's, what you need for the recording. So what it actually effectively does, uh, it analyzes the free, the filter analyzes the frequency range. It detects a, a peak on an S and then it, it, takes that S and inverts it in phase. And the amount of, of phase inverted S that you feed back to the audio, that's controlled with the S reduction control. Simple as that. And you effectively erase the S's. And there is a minimum of side, of side effects there. OK, so that's the DS. The next stage is the transient designer. And transient designer, yes, this has defined the the, the yeah it, it created its 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 own product category basically because it was level independent dynamics processing, no threshold, and and the way it does that is that in here we have like envelope followers um, that are tracing the audio input, and we have a fixed envelope that we create ourselves sort of as a reference signal for uh, for the processing. And when you take a, 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 a curve of a signal and then you have your reference curve going along with that, you, we just take the difference of the two and the difference can be directly used to trigger a VCA. A VCA is a voltage controlled amplifier and it, and it acts on those uh, voltage changes, we're talking millivolts, millivolt changes, and thereby totally follows the the instrument or the vocal that you're processing. There's nothing artificial like you would have with an, with an attack and release uh, on, on a compressor. This is something that you set, but it has nothing to do with the music. In here, the music decides on the time constants to use. So uh, on the attack, for example, you can boost or diminish the attack by 15 dB. And you can give a snare an incredible amount of kick, uh, or you can pro make a vocal more pronounced, on uh, uh, more more precise in in, in uh, articulation and stuff like that. On the other hand, on the when when you look down the signal to 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 the to the end of the signal, you get like a, a sustained portion, and you can shorten the sustained portion by twenty four dB or you can prolong the sustain portion by the same amount. Now that is on its own super cool because reducing the amount of sustain literally is like using a D-verb. And uh, I, I remember that, uh, that little story from a Swedish broadcast company. They, uh, they had like local offices all over the country and they needed to come up with um, a, a sound that as if they were all working in the same studio. Now, obviously, that was pretty hard to achieve. Everybody sounded different. 
So they said, hey, we're going to have one vocal or one reverb that we're going to, that everybody has to use um, so that we sound alike. But for that, we need to take the reverb that is in each room out before we're going to apply the new one. And that's where they took in a whole lot of transient designers just to use the less sustained function and to deverb those rooms. Another application I remember uh, was also kind of weird and it was more like sound reproduction or Foley stage work. And I was in London at the time and uh, an engineer uh, said to me, all right, if that's so cool, then do the following. And, he, and uh, I, uh, here's a sample of a, of a slamming door. Now make this sound in a, as, as if you're like in the open field and, and, and with it's all snow white. <laughs> okay, how might that sound? And I was just like thinking, okay, it's probably super dry and you only have a very short pulse on the door and that's probably the only thing that you hear. So I said, okay, I'm going to reduce the sustain of it and I'm going to add a bit of attack. And he went, oh, what, what did you do? How did you do that? <laughs> he was kind of surprised that it was that easy. And it is. So it doesn't matter whether you're going to record vocals especially the hip-hop guys actually really dig the trends in designer on their vocals to get that impact on the voice. Or if you're going to do 40 stage work, or if you're going to do live performances, stuff like that, or you sample for sampling stuff, this is ideal to play with and it saves a lot of time. F for example, you need to have more reverb and you know how hard it is. If you have a natural reverb, then you want to prolong this reverb. How do you do that? And find a matching reverb that is sounding like the original one is a process. In here, it is just this. And that's it. And it takes the original reverb and stretches it. So super easy, time-saving, ideal. Next in line, and we stay here as we go through it from left to right, is our nice... VU meter in the typical SPL layout. Now the uh, the VU can show either the gain reduction, which you see here, this is GR, or the VU value for input and output. And if you if you let's say if you let's talk about the input, the calibration for the zero dB in here is always plus four dBU. So when this calibration switch is set to zero. But we all know that this is far too low in level for modern productions since we have like AD converters that go to full scale at plus 15, 18, 20 dB even or even 24 dB. So a VU, it would just, the needle would stick to the right all the time and then it doesn't make sense to use the, the VU. So that's why you need that calibration switch and if you set it to plus 6 dB then the 0 dB would be effectively plus 6 plus the 4 dB from, from, from the balancing so plus 10 dB um, and, and then you can add up 3 dB until the needle hits uh, the right. So that's actually ideal when your converter is going up to plus 15 dBU uh, to have 0 dB FS full scale. Um, because always remember the VU is lower in level than a peak value. Next in line is that deassing LED that we have here. And that is when you engage the deasser, this will illuminate when it detects an S. We already spoke about the two post and the next switch is the EQ pre-transient designer. Now, the equalizer section, which we're going to talk later about, uh, can be switched with this switch in between DS and transient design right here. And that makes total sense if you want to uh, have the transient designer react on certain frequencies or even the opposite, not react on a certain frequency range. That's why it's interesting to, to be capable of switching that DS right in front of the transient designer. The overlap LED, well, yeah, everything is too hot, this will illuminate. Next in line is the compressor section. As you can see, it's just two controls, the compression control and the makeup gain control. Now, effectively for the compression, you only use uh, 
the compression control up here. It's effectively a threshold control. The ratio is set to a fixed 2.5 um, to 1 ratio. Now you might say, hey, I need a attack and a release control, and uh, we don't, we're not so sure about that, because you don't know how to set attack and release in a live situation where everything can change rapidly. So what we thought is the better way of doing is that our envelope followers trace the input signal and thereby understand the speed of the attack, so the climb rate of the attack as well as the slew rate um, of, of the release control. So we follow it and that sets the time constants all for the purpose of a minimum amount of distortion or pumping effects. Because that is the thing that you don't want to have in a live recording. It should be a safe recording. And that is what this compressor is being designed for. Furthermore, in here is what we call double VCA drive. That means we're using actually two VCAs in this compressor. This is a lot of yeah, this is expensive to do, but the benefit is that the way they are used is that one VCA only operates on the negative half wave, whereas the other VCA operates the positive half wave. So they actually split the job and they can thereby do double as much dB range as if they would do both the positive and the negative with one VCA. Furthermore, after that, they are both being added together in a, in a differential summing stage. And there, all of the artifacts that have been happening in the either and not in the, other, in the other VCA, all of the artifacts are being diminished by the common mode rejection of to about 6 dB. So this is the benefit. It's pretty much the same setup as you would have with a balanced wiring, where you have a positive and a negative half wave and a differential stage. We do exactly the same, but we're using two VCAs instead for the compression and thereby compression is super unobtrusive. You can compress a lot without hearing it. The last section is the equalizer and airband section. So these are two semi-parametric EQs. So with like a low mid frequency control ranging from um, 30 Hertz to 700 Hertz and what do we have here? A mid-high frequency control from 680 Hz up to 15 kilohertz. Both of these bands can be boosted by plus or, uh, boosted or cut plus or minus 12 dB. Now the way that we, uh, we handle the bandwidth in here is that the harder you drive, more boost, the more cut you do, the more narrow the frequency is going to become. So especially when you want to erase a nasty frequency and you need a lot of reduction on these, they become more narrow so that not the whole audio is going to be affected by it. It just narrows it. On the other hand, if you just want to add a bit of warmth in the vocal, you just want to set it to like 300 hertz and add uh, one or two or three dB on it, uh, then you want to have this in a wide queue. And this is exactly what happens in these filters. There is also an air band up here, which is set to very high frequencies. And it's plus or minus 10 dB that you can add on with a coil filter. Coil filter, it tends to be very uh, subtle, noiseless, and just nice sounding, very warm and round sounding. And it gives that air into a vocal. It really makes it like it opens the lid, so to speak. It's, it's, it's really nice. Finally, you have an output control that ranges from minus 20 to plus 60B. So this is used to, to make an optimum adjustment to the products, so the, the units that follow thereafter. Now talking about the outputs, on the rear panel of the channel one, um, you always have two outputs. So there's this output split already built in. That means you can run one to front of house, the other one to monitoring, if you like, or one to monitoring and the other one goes to record. Or whatever section you, or you want to drive it to something else, you want to take one output and go for, to put it into a reverb, you can do all that. It's already actively split. There is also a preamp output 
on the back side and that is directly after the, the uh, microphone preamplifier. So if you want to be safe and you want to just record that without any other uh, f functions, processors, you can do that and record that. And the last switch that we have is the mute switch. Well, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. It silences the channel one's output. Um, yeah, that's it. The channel one Mark three. It's one of the most. Uh, it's yeah. I I had haven't seen a channel strip with more features than this one has, and it's all gorgeous. Still, with all of these functions, it's relatively clean and and easy to operate. There is nothing really complicated about about this. Um, yeah, I was super happy to get to give this another generation of life, and uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as we do. Yeah, and um, yeah, hope to see you soon. Thanks for watching and bye-bye.